in the summer of 2004. My family was supposed to vacation in Kennebunkport, Maine. I was about 14 at the time. My father was stuck in business meetings, so he would be coming up from Manhattan a few days after us. My mom wanted to drive up, which was super annoying to me at the time. But we didn't have a choice, and my brother, sister, and I loaded into the car and began the drive. The drive there was uneventful, but there were various delays, and we ended up arriving a lot later than we originally planned. Because of this, the owners of the house we were renting had turned in for the night, and we weren't able to get a hold of them to get the keys. It sounds like horrible planning, but apparently they were very strict about the time frame to come pick up the keys. My mom, unfazed, decided that she wanted lobster, so we went to one of our two favorite spots. While we were eating, she called up my dad to see if he could make us reservations at a nearby hotel. While we were enjoying the lobster, a guy came up and started chatting with my mom. I figured it was just a friendly local making conversation. During this, my dad calls my mom, and my mom excuses herself to speak with him. Apparently all the hotels were booked for the night. Go figure. It was the height of vacation season in Kennebunkport. The plan was for us to drive to the next nearest town, just to find somewhere to stay, until we could pick up the keys for our vacation home. Apparently the local had been listening to my mom's conversation and came back over once she got off the phone. There was nothing outwardly strange about him. He was clean cut, unassuming, and fit in with the clientele. He told my mom that he had a big home with a guest house where we were more than welcome to stay and his wife wouldn't mind. Immediately my reaction was, F that. No way in the world was I staying at a random guy's house in creepy Maine in the dark. No offense to anyone living in Maine, but the streets get creepy and dark at night. The guy said that he was in finance. My mom was an investment banker, and they chatted enough for my mom to determine that he wasn't totally full of it. I call my dad hysterical, and he said that I was overreacting, and that I needed to get out of the city more often, and accept that sometimes people are just nice. So my mom, brother, sister, and I got into our car and followed him back to his house. The guest house was very nice, fully furnished, and had two bedrooms, but the beds were located right under the window in each room. It just seemed out of place to me. Fast forward to later that night. We were all getting ready to go to bed. My mom hears a knock on the door and it's the guy. He said he just wanted to check to make sure that we got settled in, which is a nice thing to do. But 30 minutes later, he comes back to check in again. At this point, my mom said, uh, thanks, we're good. Uh, thanks, we're good. We'll stop off tomorrow morning and drop off the keys. Fast forward again, 30 to 45 minutes later, I couldn't sleep, and apparently nobody else could either. We then heard rustling from outside, which was odd, because the guest house was nowhere near trees or in close proximity to bushes that might cause such a noise. At this point, I see my mom wide awake and looking at the window. Let me add that none of these windows had curtains or any kind of covering. The guy said it was because his wife was in the process of redecorating. When I looked, there was a figure just standing there. I thought it was going to have a heart attack. I don't know how long he had been there for. When the figure walked away, my mom waited for a bit and then told us to get our stuff together. She wasn't messing around. We had my dad on the phone at this point and he was pretty much flipping out on my mom. She said that she was going to put stuff in the car and to follow her out. I would say this was around 2 a.m. When we got into the car, we pulled around to the front of the main house so my mom could return the key. When we got to the front, all the lights were off, 
It looked like no one had been home. Everything was black. Also, the two cars that had been there were now gone. After seeing this, my mom became pretty unsettled and said we were leaving and proceeded to drive to the gate. The gate at the end of the driveway had been dead bolted and padlocked shut. It wasn't a super strong gate, so my dad said to rev it and to just get out of there. We were in a big SUV. We drove straight back to New York City, not speaking the entire time. We have never returned back to Maine since, and my parents refused to speak about this. But one night my drunk cousin told me something. Apparently he had overheard a conversation they were having about this. He said, They didn't tell you? The owners of the house were on vacation. I'm assuming that my mom or dad followed up with the local authorities and figured that out, but they never told us. I don't know who that man was or what he was planning on doing, but I'm curious to know if there were any known serial killers or murderers who lived in or were traveling through that area at the time. I eventually spoke to my parents about what happened that night. They didn't have a ton of details for me and frankly didn't want to talk about it. My mom first apologized to me because she knows it was a shitty situation and still thinks she's a horrible mother. She's not, by the way. She's awesome. I asked her what made her suspect something was wrong, or what made her put her guard up. Essentially, she said that it was dark, and the longer the night went on for, the more it sunk in that it wasn't a great idea for us to be staying here, and she should have never agreed to it. However, the tipping point was when the guy came by the second time. His demeanor had done a 180. She felt there was something off about him. She described it as somewhat of an edge and both his attitude and tone of voice. He seemed to be anxious and annoyed, but was trying to come across as a concerned host. He also kept looking back to the main house during the conversation and wasn't really paying attention to her when she said that everything was fine all of those signs put together made her realize that something wasn't quite right here. It was like there was something hidden beneath his exterior that was coming out, and when she caught a glimpse of it, she didn't like it. When my mom pulled up to the house, at first she was just happy we found a place to settle in for the night after a long drive, so she wasn't paying attention to everything as she should have been. But when we left the place, she was a bit more aware. The first thing she noticed was that the main house was undergoing renovations, which might explain why it was unoccupied. The exterior looked kind of incomplete, and that didn't jive with what our host had told her initially. Neither she nor my father called the cops. She said in hindsight, they probably should have, but she was primarily concerned with getting out of there especially after breaking through the entry gate with the SUV. It wasn't until some time passed that she realized that she probably should have alerted the authorities. I don't remember this next point, but apparently the house was a lot further away than she was led to believe. This makes me think that it was not in the main part of town. I'm not great with geography, and my mom doesn't remember exactly where it was. She said she was focused on following him, and wasn't really paying attention to the street names. Plus, it was dark. In regards to what my drunk cousin told me about the owners being on vacation, my dad said that he was a drunk. I mean, sure, but I pressed him on this a bit. Apparently, how my cousin came up with that idea is because when my aunt and uncle were talking with my parents about it one night, I guess someone floated the idea that perhaps the owners were on vacation and this person was house-sitting for them. However, my parents both believed that the house was either being renovated or the owners weren't there for whatever reason. I'm not sure if these answers really answer anything. And frankly, they make me feel worse about the whole situation than I did before. I think my parents felt horrible and extremely guilty and still do and tried to just bury this and move on.
The story happened in the spring of 2019. My name is Jason. I'm 28 now, but I was 24 at the time. One of the things I love doing is traveling the world. Every year I travel for about six to eight months, going from country to country. Apart from dealing with flight cancellations, bad weather, and the occasional delay, I always end up having a good time. And I've never been in any serious situations. I generally keep to myself and out of trouble. But in April of 2019, I witnessed something truly horrifying. I have a decent amount of Haitian friends. They invited me on a trip to Haiti. Normally, Haiti is not a place that I would go to by myself, as it's a very unstable country. But since three of my friends, who are referred to as Jamal, Gabriel, and Charles, would also be there, I accepted the invitation. We visited a smaller town called Jacmel, which is a countryside settlement with beautiful beaches. But things took a turn for the worse when we crossed the border into the Dominican Republic to head to Santo Domingo. We stayed in an Airbnb and rented a car on the outskirts of the city. The first few days went well. We drove around and explored the area. But on the third night, we returned to our rental at around 2 a.m. and saw a suspicious black SUV in the distance. Gabriel, who was sitting in the front seat, said, Hey, slow down. This looks sketchy as fuck. I did as he asked, slowed down and eventually stopping, ensuring that all the doors were locked. We saw a person get out of the SUV. It was a light-skinned woman with braids. I admit she was very attractive, but something about her was... off. I've read somewhere that sometimes criminals will send their girlfriends in first as a decoy to scope out a target and then report back to them. She tried to open our Airbnb gate and looked around to ensure nobody was watching. She then tried to open the gate to the house next door. When she failed, she returned to her SUV and drove away. We waited a while longer to make sure the SUV didn't circle back before returning to the Airbnb, making sure to lock the gate behind us. We were all pretty tired by then, and soon we fell asleep. Around 4 a.m., I woke up in a panic when I heard screaming coming from the house next door. I looked out of the window and saw that same SUV from earlier speeding away. Not long after that, the house next door was surrounded by Dominican police. It turns out that the man living next door was stabbed to death. We told the police what we saw, but no one was arrested in connection to the murder, as far as I know. I'm not sure what the relationship was between the man and the braided woman was, but I find it especially alarming that she tried to break into our Airbnb. After the incident, my friends and I left that area immediately. This story happened in Lamar, Alabama around 2009. For context, I am a female and I was 16 years old when this happened. I have two brothers, who I will call Spencer and Leo. Spencer was 17, and Leo was 18. At the time, our parents' marriage was steadily declining. They got along most of the time, but whenever they would have arguments, it would always get ugly. Their fights would always end up with them shouting at each other, then giving each other the silent treatment. The atmosphere in the house was always tense, and it sometimes became unbearable. It was the night of November 5th, 2009. My mom started calling out my dad about something he had done wrong in the house. My dad didn't appreciate that, and it didn't take long to escalate into an explosive argument. Afterward, they did their usual silent treatment. At around 8 p.m., my brothers and I had enough of their shit and we told him that we were heading out, so we all piled into the car for a night drive. Spencer was driving that night. 
We just wandered around and eventually came across an old abandoned house in a very dark, secluded area. We should go check things out inside, Spencer said. Oh yeah, that sounds fun, replied Leo. I wasn't fond of the idea because I've always had this gripping fear of abandoned houses, especially in the dark. That doesn't sound like a good idea. Well, I guess you'll just have to stay in the car. I hope the Night Stalker doesn't pay you a visit. <laughs> I really didn't want to be alone in the car out here. So I decided to tough it out and go with my brothers. We walked up to the house and the door was unlocked. This place looked like it was abandoned for quite some time. The exterior was severely decayed with overgrown grass and piles of trash all over. The interior was still somewhat well put together, other than the spider webs and dust. We got out our flashlights and explored the inside of the house. While going room to room, we suddenly heard a door from somewhere inside slowly opening. Shh! Did you hear that? Spencer looked concerned. We then heard footsteps. My heart was pounding, and I put my hand on my mouth to prevent myself from screaming. Luckily, whoever it was walked past the room we were in. I carefully locked the door. We then heard an angry voice say, you fucked up big time by coming here. When I find you, I'm going to do whatever I want to you, and no one is going to hear you scream. I felt a chill crawl up my back. We had broken into the home of an absolute maniac. The man walked back down the hallway and began striking the door of the room. We desperately tried to find something to defend ourselves with, and by luck, I found an old crowbar. Suddenly the door burst open and a figure lunged towards us while screaming. This all happened so fast that I didn't have time to hand off the crowbar to one of my brothers, so I took a chance and swung it myself. I landed a blow to the man's head and he fell to the floor. Kayla, why'd you do that? We broke into this man's house and now we've assaulted him. I didn't know what else to do. Is he dead? Spencer checked the man's neck for a pulse. <sighs> Thank God. He's still breathing. Okay, we need to get out of here now. We quickly left the house and piled back into the car. As we were backing away, we saw the man running towards us with the crowbar in his hands. Spencer got us out of there as quickly as he could. We were all pretty shaken up, but decided not to call the police because we were the ones who were trespassing. We also didn't tell our parents about it. They barely got along as it was, so they were dealing with enough stress already. Two years later, they eventually got a divorce. We never went exploring in abandoned houses ever again, and for those who do want to explore abandoned places, you should probably make sure that they are actually abandoned. My name is Alex, and I'm a former soldier of the US Army. I would like to tell my story not for recognition, but to help people understand that sometimes you are all that stands between life and death. For context, I'm a 5'10", 190 pound male. I served in the army since I was 18, and I only joined because I was kicked out of my house and was basically homeless. This happened shortly after I left the military. When I left, I had little to no money in my pocket. Like most vets, I was screwed out of much of my disability by the VA in compensation for the expenses that soldiers have while being underpaid. I had to find a place to live after I went back home to Florida. To make a long story short, my family scattered all over the state after my mom's death. My sister was now married with kids by this time. My dad was somewhere on the beach getting drunk with his retirement money, 
and nobody to this day knows where my brother is. But that's a story for another time. I didn't know where to start. All I knew is that I couldn't go back to being homeless again. I took a cab from the airport to my best friend's house, who I knew from high school. I had no idea if he even lived there anymore, but I didn't really have any other options. I had two duffel bags with me, the clothes on my back, and about 500 bucks in my pocket. I think you can imagine when I knocked on his door. My faith in the good Lord was being tested. Thankfully, my friend Nick answered the door. We spent almost six to seven hours just hanging out and walking around his neighborhood, just catching up from all the years we had been apart. I hated with all my being having to ask, but I managed to get it out. Hey, Nick. Uh, I kind of have nowhere else to go. Would you mind... He cut me off and said... After the first hour you sat on my couch, I accepted the responsibility of giving you a place to sleep. You didn't need to ask. I just knew. I nearly teared up. I stayed with Nick for the next two days. He then brought me to a property that he inherited from his grandmother that passed away. It was a single-story house that was only half completed. I'll describe the setting as best I can. It was an upper-middle-class neighborhood surrounding a large lake. The house was a ranch-style home made of brick that was undergoing remodeling. However, the master bedroom, the bathroom, kitchen, and living room were all finished. The two guest bedrooms, the attic, garage, and foyer were all bare bones. We spent about six hours cleaning up the place, and I helped finish some ongoing projects. After I got settled, we both had the same idea. I would work on the house while looking for a job. It was simple enough, and I was honestly looking forward to it. I was left with food, a list of projects by priority, a key to the shed, which had all the tools, a credit card monitored by Nick for project expenses, and a nice mountain bike that used to belong to Nick's old man, so I had a way to travel around town. I was introduced to the neighbors on both sides of me, who had families of their own and were extremely friendly. On some occasions, the wife of one of the neighbors would bring me leftovers. Her brother was apparently in the Marines, and she knew exactly what I was going through. So she did what she could for me, which is one of the kindest things I've ever experienced in my life. After three weeks of job interviews and housing projects, other than a grueling battle with the VA for my disability benefits, things were looking up for me. My neighbor to the right of me, who I will call Travis, greeted me while I was working on the foyer. He told me that he and his wife would be leaving for about a week, because a branch of their company was being shut down. He would only be about four hours away. He said that their daughter, who I will call Sarah, would be coming in and out of his house because she was working. He just wanted me to keep an eye out on her and his place, since she had been caught having parties on more than one occasion. I shook his hand and told him not to worry, and he left the very next day. Four days went by, and everything was fine. Nick had moved one of his old TVs into my place, so I was catching up on all the movies I had missed. That's when my phone went off. I didn't recognize the number. When I answered it, I was kind of hoping that a family member was reaching out to me. Hello? Alex, this is Sarah. I need you to come over right now. Uh, Sarah? Travis's daughter. W what's wrong? Someone has been walking around outside of my house for the last 30 minutes, and they just tried to use the back door to get in. Oh, are they in the house? No, but I think they're searching for some way inside. I called the police, but I don't know how long it'll be until they get here. Okay, I understand. Listen to me carefully. Lock yourself in a bathroom. I'm on my way right now. I hung up and ran to the kitchen window and peeked out through the blinds. Sure enough, I caught the sight of a tall, dark figure walking to the back side of Sarah's house. I only got a quick look, but from what I could tell, he was at least my height, 
with a strong build. I grabbed the keys to the shed and made my way to the backyard. The fence that separated our yards was on the shorter side. I had to crawl so the intruder wouldn't see me. I unlocked the shed and opened the door just enough to squeeze inside. I armed myself with a machete and a hammer as a backup weapon. I left the same way I got in and made my way over to Sarah's house. I was creeping around the side where I had seen the intruder before. I was hoping he would come the same way again so I could surprise him. Just as I was about to round the corner, I heard the glass shatter. I immediately froze. The intruder had smashed the sliding glass door located at the back of the house. I could hear his shoes crunching the glass on the hardwood floor. Being careful not to reveal myself, I peeked around the corner. He was inside and making his way to the other end of the house. He would hear me if I came the same way as him while I was wearing my boots. So I untied my boots before following him. I got a good look at the general floor plan. In front of me was a living room with the glass all over the floor. Further past that was the kitchen, and to the left was the front door. I leapt onto the carpet to avoid the glass, and hid behind the couch with the machete in hand. I focused my breathing and listened. I heard a loud bashing sound, followed by what sounded like Sarah screaming her lungs out. There's no time to waste, I thought to myself and sprinted upstairs to the master bedroom. The intruder had made it through the bedroom door and was now trying to get to Sarah in the bathroom. I had the element of surprise. I remembered everything that I was taught and training, and in a split second, I pulled out the hammer and threw it as hard as I could at the intruder. As soon as it made contact, he let out a yelp of pain and stumbled backward. I must have looked like an absolute lunatic to this guy when I entered. I had the machete raised above my head, and I was about to massacre this guy Jason Voorhees style all over this bedroom. Everything stopped once I saw who the intruder was. He was just a kid. He couldn't have been no older than 16. He was a Hispanic male with a ridiculous haircut and mustache. He had a horrified look on his face. I could see the tears welling up in his eyes. I paused for a moment, and his face went from the brink of crying to a furious scowl. He picked up the hammer and charged at me. He swung and missed. I retaliated by cutting across the intruder's face and was about to impale him through the skull. I then heard shouting from downstairs. This is the police. Come out now with your hands up, or you will be shot. He's in here. He needs medical attention. I yelled. In a nutshell, I was put in cuffs until things were squared away. Sarah was let out of the bathroom, and Travis was called right away. It turns out, the intruder was the best friend of another guy who Sarah had dated some time ago. Apparently, Sarah recently tested positive for being pregnant. When her ex-boyfriend discovered this, he became furious, so his dumbass best friend got involved. Nothing like throwing her life away over someone else's relationship. The boy was rushed to the ER for the straight edge kiss I gave him. His face was sliced open from the bottom corner of his chin to the top of his head. Sarah apparently got a hold of me because Travis left my number on the fridge. She was told to call me just in case something like this happened. I can't say I feel bad for the kid though. He earned that giant scar on his face when he decided to rush at me with a hammer. Not exactly the start I wanted to have within the first month of living there. It's been about three months. I'm now working for Florida's Department of Agriculture. I still live in the same house, which is only one bedroom away from being completed. To everyone listening, never just be a bystander. Someone's life or death can be determined by your actions. Before we begin, 
I want to let everyone know that this is a true story. Not a single detail has been fabricated. During my first year of middle school, I developed a bit of a reputation as a wild child, and I've had several run-ins with our school's resource officer. One day when I was at home watching TV in the living room with my sister, someone rang the doorbell. This startled my younger sister because our parents weren't home. I was the oldest of four children, and despite my rebellious nature, I was still the big sister. I wasn't too worried about someone at our door because I figured it was probably the mailman or one of those annoying solicitors, or perhaps it was our neighbor checking in on us. I went to the door and politely asked, Who is it? Open up. It's the police. A man's voice responded. By the way, our door had no peephole. That's a whole other story. But I could tell there was something off about this man's voice. It seemed cold and detached. I turned to my sister. I don't know if this guy's really a cop. Go upstairs and go check on Jason and Ashley. I'll handle this. She darted up the stairs. The guy on the other side of the door began asking for somebody by name, claiming that they lived there. I think you got the wrong place. No one by that name lives here. Well, I have a warrant that says otherwise. Are you lying to me, young lady? No. The guy that you're looking for doesn't live here. Then who just ran up the stairs? This immediately creeped me out. There was a long window by the front door. It had one of those thick frost layerings. It wasn't easy to tell who was inside if you were on the outside looking through it. But it didn't look like he was standing in front of the window. So when did he take a look? He would have had to focus real hard to see my sister because there were no lights on. Furthermore, it was midday, so it should have looked completely dark from where he was. I automatically felt threatened. Whoever this man was had crossed into creep territory. So now I was going to be a jerk. It was my sister, and she's obviously not the grown man that you're looking for. Why did she run? Because you're a fucking weirdo. Oh, excuse me, you don't talk to a police officer like that. The way he said that sounded like he was becoming annoyed, like I should just trust him on his word alone. Well, if you are a cop, you're not a very good one, because you're at the wrong address. And how do I even know that you are a cop? You should just open the door and see for yourself. That's when I saw my sister peeking around the corner at the top of the steps. Get back, I whispered. We rarely get people at our door when my parents aren't home, but it's not impossible. I had this habit of locking the screen door. It was very strong for a screen door as well. And to clarify, it was one of those screen doors directly outside of the front door. Our front porch was open. I figured I would take the risk and open the door, just to see if this man was really a cop. When I opened up, the man on the porch did look like a cop. His hand was on his gun, and he kept looking behind me as if he was searching for something. His behavior made me trust him even less. He began grilling me about my sister, trying to catch me in a lie. Okay, so who really ran up those stairs? It was my sister. I already told you. How do I know it's your sister and not the person I'm looking for? Look, you have the wrong address. The man glared at me through his aviators. It was hard to see his face because of how big they were. It was like he was trying to hide his face. I know it's a silly thought for a kid, but my mom and I watched tons of true crime shows together. I know it was stupid to open the door, but I had this sinking feeling that he knew that we were alone. Up to this point, he did not ask for my parents, not even once. I just wanted to keep him in sight because I knew my parents would be home soon. The cop explained to me that the man he was looking for lived at our house, and according to his paperwork, this was still his current address. I informed the cop that we have been living here for a few years now. 
and I knew for a fact the woman before us lived here alone. This frustrated him, and he informed me in a demanding tone that he was going to check the house himself. Um, no you're not. Young lady, you're interfering with police business. Now open up the door before you get in trouble. I'm not stupid. I know that you need special court papers to come inside. I was in a stubborn mood, and nobody wins against me when I'm in a stubborn mood. Unless, of course, you're my parents. Cop or not, this man wasn't coming inside the house or going anywhere near my siblings. That's when he demanded to speak to my parents for the first time. Where are your parents? I want to speak to them about your behavior. He was trying to use the get me into trouble tactic to frighten me. In reality, my mom was far scarier than him. He would have been afraid of my mom because she's the type to kick someone's ass and then ask questions later. But she doesn't play around when it comes to her kids. She wouldn't assault or threaten a police officer, but he would have been in for it because my mom would have unleashed a verbal onslaught, full-blown Karen mode, level 10. My parents aren't here right now. They're at the grocery store. I had a feeling that he already knew my parents weren't home. Up until then, he hadn't asked for them. I didn't know if he was a cop or not, but I didn't want to aggravate him further by telling him a lie. I know that my behavior was annoying, but I wasn't going to give him a reason to call me a liar. That's when he reached for the screen door and tried to open it. That's when he discovered it was locked. Open the damn door! I said no. I then slammed the door shut so he couldn't ask me again. I snuck halfway up the stairs and listened. He began yanking and tugging on the screen door. Little bitch, I should arrest you and teach you a lesson. After that, he just walked through our neighbor's yard like nothing happened. That's when I realized that I never saw any cop cars in our driveway. We lived in town homes, so I could see all the vehicles from a distance, and I didn't spot a single cruiser parked nearby. My parents showed up almost right after he left. I told my mom what happened. Well, you shouldn't have opened the door, and you should have called me right away. What's the matter with you? You're grounded. Now come help me with the groceries. I couldn't help but notice that our neighbors checked on us far more often after this incident, and our parents got us a babysitter whenever they left the house without us. I'm not 100% sure, but something tells me that that man who came to the house wasn't a cop, and I would have put my family in danger by allowing him inside. To everyone listening, Teach your kids that a uniform is just not enough. You should ask for their badge number and call the police station to verify if you can. It also doesn't hurt to invest in a strong, sturdy screen door. Earlier this year, I hiked through the Appalachian Trail, going northbound. It was an unbelievable experience I'll never forget. I've met so many great people along the way, and have had many unforgettable experiences, including the one that you're about to hear. I was in Vermont, in an area called the Glastonbury Wilderness, which is located near the infamous Bennington Triangle. I was hiking alone at the time. The rest of my tramily, trail family, were all within a mile of each other. We were scheduled to meet up at a hostel that night. While I was hiking through the wilderness, I noticed that the forest in the mountain had fallen silent. No birds, no critters, even the wind had stopped. I have a background in forestry, and I've done a fair amount of backpacking before, so I know that the lack of sound usually indicates a large predator is nearby. This has happened before, so I wasn't immediately terrified. I took note of it and hiked onward. About ten minutes later, on my right side, toward the mountain, something big began thundering toward me. Heavy footfall echoed through the surrounding trees. I stopped hiking at this point, as I felt the hairs on my neck and arms stand up. 
I was looking through the trees to see if I could spot something. Maybe another 10 seconds went by, when something at least 7 to 8 feet tall stood up and looked directly at me from behind some rocks and fallen tree trunks. I'll never forget how intense that primal fight-or-flight response was. Fuck that noise, I said, as I hauled ass down the trail, making sure I made lots of noise while doing so, as you're supposed to do when bears are nearby. At that point, I assumed it was a bear. I caught up with one of my hiker friends, and she said that I looked pale and terrified. I told her that I was fairly certain I saw a bear maybe a quarter mile back, and after calming me down a bit, we both began laughing, as this was my first bear encounter. Now, if this was the end of the story, I would have totally believed it was a bear, and while it was scary at the time, I wouldn't have thought too much about it, as hikers often see bears on the trails, it's a common occurrence. It was what I heard a few days later that really frightened me. A few of my hiker friends and I caught a ride from a shuttle driver so we could go to town and resupply. We were all chatting, and the driver asked us if we had any crazy experiences. I didn't mention my encounter because I thought it was just a bear. After more conversation with the other hikers, we asked him if he had any crazy stories. He told us that just a few days prior, the same day that I had my encounter, he received a call to pick up a hiker from a road crossing just outside the Glastonbury Wilderness, exactly where I was. She informed him that she was quitting the trail and asked to be taken to the airport. When he asked why, she told him this. I heard a baby crying in the forest. When I looked around, I saw something that was way too big to be a bear. It was coming right for me. This apparently spooked her so bad that she fled the forest. That's when I told the driver what I had experienced on that same day. Whoa, that's crazy. I'm glad you made it out of there alive. Listen, I've camped and hunted around this area all my life, and I can tell you that we really don't get much bears around here. In fact, I can't recall a single instance of a bear being spotted anywhere near those trails. Maybe a moose every once in a while, but that's it. However, I've heard stories of some kind of deranged cult living somewhere deep in the forest. Over the years, many hikers have reported being stalked or attacked by people dressed in animal hides. And the game wardens have never found anything, but still, I've heard too many stories just to dismiss it as a rumor. I'm not sure what would be scarier, seeing Bigfoot in the wilderness of New England or seeing some psychopath dressed up as Bigfoot in the wilderness of New England. Either way, this is definitely one of my more memorable hiking stories. Being home alone isn't scary at all by itself, but it'll quickly turn into a nightmare if you suddenly realize that you're not alone. This story happened in early December of 2008. For context, I live in Calgary, Alberta. My name is Jack, and I was 15 years old when this happened. I have an older brother, who I'll refer to as Angelo. He was 22 at the time. My brother was staying the night at his girlfriend's house, meaning that I was home alone for the entire night. My parents were attending a wedding about 30 minutes away. They were too drunk to drive back home, so they called me to let me know that they would be staying the night at a hotel. Now, like most introverted teens, I was thrilled to have the place all to myself. However, we lived in a rather big house, and it always gave me the creeps at night, especially when I was alone. I would usually deal with it by locking myself in my bedroom and never coming out. My initial excitement quickly faded away, and was replaced by a general sense of unease. I began to feel like I wasn't alone. After a while, I could no longer chalk it up to the usual paranoia. It genuinely felt like I was being watched. I tried distracting myself by playing video games, but the feeling did not go away. 
Eventually, I had to use the restroom. The upstairs bathroom in the hallway that I usually use was temporarily blocked by furniture while my parents' bathroom was being remodeled, leaving me no choice but to use the bathroom downstairs. So I made my way past the clutter and down the stairs. After relieving myself, I walked out. I then noticed something that made me freeze in place. In the darkness of my father's downstairs office, I noticed a dark figure staring back at me. They were standing as still as a statue, as if they were hoping that I couldn't see them. Angelo? Is that you? I asked. Suddenly, the figure scaled my father's desk and came rushing toward me. My adrenaline went through the roof. I ran upstairs to my parents' bedroom and locked myself in there. The intruder began pounding on the door and even tried to kick it in. Thankfully, the door was pretty solid and could withstand his assaults. But I knew that I would have to call the police. It was only a matter of time before he managed to break the door. But to my horror, I realized I left my phone in my room, so it was basically impossible to call for help. However, I got lucky. I heard several footsteps running up the stairs, followed by, Drop the knife now and put your hands in the air. After some commotion, It's the police. Is there anyone else here? I carefully came out of my parents' bedroom, and there were several police officers in the hallway. They told me that our next door neighbor had seen the intruder entering my house through the back door. They took my statement, arrested the intruder, and hauled him away. Later on, my parents came back. They had already heard everything that happened after the police called them. My brother also heard about it too. Angelo apologized for forgetting to lock the back door. I'm really glad that our next door neighbor contacted the police. I might not be here otherwise. This experience has left me forever traumatized, to the point where I refuse to ever buy a house, even all these years later. I now live in a two-bedroom apartment on the highest floor of my building, and I feel a lot safer for it. This happened when I was in college. I lived in Isla Vista, a student community at UCSB, notorious for being a party school, and it fully lived up to its reputation. I like partying, but holy shit, these people were off the wall. As such, there were a lot of students who put themselves in dangerous situations, drinking way too much, not being careful, and forgetting to lock doors, etc. It had a very isolated vibe, and anyone who was hanging around who wasn't college-aged immediately looked out of place. One night after having a few drinks, I came home to my small house where I lived with my two roommates. It was probably around 2.30 a.m. We were all serious students, and when we partied, it wasn't your typical UCSB mega-rager, more like a small get-together with friends. We would often have a few people spend the night, sleep on our furniture and our beds, as the case may be. That night, my roommates had somebody over who I didn't know, and I saw that this person was sleeping on the couch. I didn't turn on any lights because I didn't want to wake him up. But as I was passing by the couch to enter my bedroom, I noticed the figure was lying very stiff. He gave off a strange vibe. It was like he was putting all of his energy into being as still as possible. I paused, and the guy quickly jerked his head to face me without moving his limbs. It was so fast that it startled me. I could see his wide open eyes glinting in the dark. Figuring that I might have startled him, or perhaps he was drunk, or maybe on some kind of stimulant and was unable to sleep, I just hurried past into my bedroom and locked the door. That guy made me nervous, and I wasn't taking any chances. Eventually, I fell asleep. At 4.30am, I woke up 
there was a strange sound at the door, almost like somebody was drumming their fingers against the wood. I lay still and listened. There came more sounds, like somebody scratching the door with their fingers, which got louder and louder. It was clear that he was using both hands and scratching as fast and hard as possible. It created an extremely loud and intimidating sound that filled me with fear. I grabbed my phone and texted my roommate. Hey, your friend is freaking me out. Is he doped up or something? Can you please go out and talk to him? He's banging and scratching at my door. She didn't respond, probably because she was sleeping. I texted my other roommate, but the end result was the same. Keep in mind that the scratching had been going on at this point for a couple of minutes. I have no idea how he could have sustained it. Scratching a wooden door with your fingernails can't feel that good. He also grabbed at the doorknob and tried turning it. Because neither of them answered, I decided to call and wake them up. I know it sounds dumb, but there was something seriously horrifying about being teased like this through the door. I knew that he was trying to scare me, and I felt like a little kid, but I could tell this guy was fucked up or something, and perhaps the police needed to be called. I wanted to loop in my roommates though, since it was one of their friends. The scratching stopped abruptly, and I called my roommate, who answered in a tired voice. Uh, hello? Hey, your friend is messed up. Can you please deal with it? He's scaring the crap out of me, and he's scratching at my bedroom door. She didn't say anything for several seconds, and when she spoke, she didn't sound tired at all. Uh, what friend? The fucking guy who was sleeping on the couch. We didn't have any guys over tonight. Call the police. Now. My adrenaline went through the roof. Before hanging up, I told her to lock her bedroom door as quickly as possible. I realized that I hadn't heard the scratching in a while, and I had no clue where the guy was. Suddenly, I heard a loud banging at the other end of the house, where my roommates, Lauren and Monica, shared a bedroom. The bangs were followed by the sound of screaming. I quickly dialed 911 as this maniac proceeded to bang against my roommate's bedroom door. Thankfully, they had locked it in time. The heaviness of the blows left no doubt that he was trying to break the door down. I told the operator the situation, and they dispatched two squad cars. The police in Isla Vista are generally used to peeling drunks off the sidewalk and breaking up brawling frat bros, but this was serious and I think the dispatcher knew how terrified I was from my tone. She stayed on the line with me. At one point, the banging stopped, and everything was silent for a while. When suddenly, I looked down, and saw that the intruder had slipped his fingers through the one-inch gap between the bottom of my door and the floor, and he was just kind of wiggling them around, and making this weird growling sound. I screamed and backed away, which I instantly regretted. In hindsight, it would have been so awesome if I just stomped the shit out of his fingers and heard him howling in pain. When the cops showed up, I heard him running and the sound of our sliding glass door opening and closing. He was gone, and the cops never caught him. My bedroom door was covered in these huge gouges that he had made by using a pair of scissors, which he discarded on the ground before he left. What terrifies me the most about this was that I walked right past him. I looked him right in the face. I realize now that he was not trying to sleep. He probably heard me open the door and freaked out because he hadn't realized that somebody else was living there. He was lying so stiff because he was trying to blend into the couch.
In the fall of 2010, I decided to go back to college. I was a single mom of three boys, but they were all in school by now, and me going back was finally possible. The school I went to is a regional campus to a very large university and located in a neighborhood that is known for crime, meth, heroin, prostitution, etc. But it was only a 20 minute drive from my house and I didn't feel unsafe about going there. My first day there was intimidating. I didn't know anyone and I was a lot older than most of the other students. I was 28 at the time. I sat down at a table in the back of the room, and a few minutes later, a woman who was around my age sat down next to me. She was very skinny, smelled like cigarettes, she had greasy hair and sunken eyes, but when she started to talk to me, she seemed normal enough. She started off the conversation by telling me that she sat close to me because I was wearing the prettiest blouse in the room. Strange, but as an awkward person, I give a lot of leeway for people who say or do awkward things before I think too much of it. She didn't have a backpack, any books, a pen or notebook, nothing. She said that her financial aid hadn't come through yet, but she didn't want to fall too far behind in class and asked if I would share my book. I agreed and gave her a pen and paper as well. After the first class, she asked if I wouldn't mind going with her to the library so she could scan a few pages from my book to take home. I agreed, and we began to head to the library. She stops and looks at her phone and says her son just texted her and needs her to come home to do something. She then asks if I could come with her. I tell her that I have another class and I couldn't go with her. I asked if she still wanted to go to the library first, and she said no, and that she had to get back to her son, but really couldn't go alone for some reason. I was confused, but I kept telling her that I couldn't go with her, and then she starts crying. At this point, we were in a common area outside, with the parking lot on one side and the library on the other. I didn't like being outside, away from people, with this woman anymore. She got really upset and starts screaming at me, basically cursing me out. I don't remember how the interaction went exactly because I was in complete shock by how quickly she transitioned from being friendly to crying and now screaming in my face. I turned around and began heading toward the library. I pulled out my phone and called my friend so that I would have someone else aware of this lady if she tried to do anything more than just scream at me. I get to the library doors and watch her. She was now standing at the edge of the parking lot. A car then pulls up next to her. The man who was driving was obviously upset with a woman. They were arguing, but I couldn't hear them from where I was. Eventually, she gets into the car and leaves with him. The next day I was dreading class because I didn't know what this woman's attitude would be the next day, but she wasn't there. In fact, she never came back to class. Looking back, I'm fairly certain that she wasn't even a student there, and for whatever reason, she was trying to lure me away. I wish I knew what her intentions were, but at the same time, I'm glad that I never had to find out. This happened when I was attending university, when I was 18 years old. I made an effort to make a lot of friends after I moved onto campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with. I even had a girlfriend. Students would usually have lunch in the cafeteria in pairs, three at the most, and I wasn't very picky about who I had lunch with because like most people in class, we were all trying to make an effort to be social. A girl named Lily asked me if I wanted to eat lunch together after class. I didn't have any reservations about it. We made small talk about school and whatnot. After that day, she kept asking me to get lunch with her. It became a pattern, 
and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no. At the time, I didn't mind, but this did mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with my other friends. In hindsight, I suppose that was the point. One day after class, somebody asked me if I could add them on social media. It was kind of a new thing back in those days. This happened right in front of Lily. I saw her face jerk toward me from a few seats over. It was such a sharp reaction that it was hard for me to ignore. By the time I got home later that day, Lily had sent me a friend request. We had no friends in common, and I don't know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised, but I guess she had just dug through the university's social media pages and found me there. It gave me a strange feeling, but what's the worst that could happen? She ended up messaging me non-stop and commenting on everything that I posted. I told myself that she was just socially awkward, but whatever. I've known worse people, or so I thought. She still always got me to eat lunch with her. Other than that, we rarely spent time together in person. I saw her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to go hang out with her, so it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other at lunch. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also named Lily. This was something that clearly bothered the other Lily. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name, or joked about her name not suiting her. She obviously didn't like my girlfriend at all, and I had an idea of why. It was hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to subtly hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it because what was I going to say? I've never known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me. I was also not interested in dating her at all. Even ignoring the weird stuff she pulled, Lily was just not my type. She tended to dress and act like a 1950s housewife and one of those adults who was still obsessed with Disney princesses, if you can imagine that. Things took an uncomfortable twist on the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me out to lunch, like she usually did, Lily asked me if I could go walk with her. Again, I didn't know how to refuse. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me into the woods. The sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log and I reluctantly joined her. She began talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried my best to placate her, but honestly, I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed to be on the verge of tears. I think I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily kissed me without warning. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. I got out of there, and I was happy to think that I wouldn't be seeing her for a while. I came back to university after the summer break. I had moved into a house with some of my friends. Without getting too much off topic, there were some serious issues with this group of friends. There was a lot of petty arguing going on, and worse. I also broke up with my girlfriend around the start of the school year, and basically... This entire mess made me recontextualize things with Lily because it suddenly didn't seem like a bad idea to socialize with her. With that said, I still did not want to be alone with her. We mostly talked online. It was around this time that I began dating a guy. Lily was not pleased to hear about that news. I think she hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend. But as I said before... That was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship, so she must have thought that she missed her chance to be with me. This is where the story gets bad. At the time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I would occasionally talk about my life and mostly reblogged photos and stuff. I was on there one day when something odd happened. One of the blogs I followed messaged me. 
I saw a screenshot of somebody asking this completely random person to analyze my about section and then asked their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I cannot stress to you how bizarre and completely out of left field it was to see someone trying to study me like a character in a book. The reply was basically, um, I don't know, sorry. But the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. <laughs> no prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I discovered was like a shrine. It was a cutesy pink and red page. There were a few posts about Lily's interests, but most of the content was focused on me. Most of the blogs were about me, chronicling things I had done recently, as well as references to things from as far back as I had known Lily. It was clear that she had been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline, gathering up every scrap of information she could about my life and filing it away in her collection. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our dates were, as if it was something more than just acquaintances getting food after class. She talked about the time that she kissed me in the woods, but she made it sound like it was mutual. She quoted lyrics from my favorite songs and talked about how she would always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me just the way I am. Things got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend. These were clearly psychotic. They talked about how he didn't deserve me, and he didn't know what he had, and that if she was with me, she would be jealous of anyone else who came near me. I don't like thinking about what kind of person would write so obsessively about their fixation on me. One thing that didn't make sense initially was that the blog also referenced Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this person to me before. Her post talked about how Stephen was such a great friend and how they had so much fun together and he would always look out for her, etc. I was trying to work out if this Stephen was an online friend when one specific post made it all click. Steven sent this to me. He knew that I would love it. The problem was, the photo was taken from my own page. She was claiming that this fictional best friend of hers shared it with her. So in her messed up fantasy life, she split me into two people. I was both the perfect best friend who was always looking out for her, and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her when I finally got over my boyfriend and all these other easy girls I hung out with. Believe it or not, Lily had an audience. She asked open questions about me in regards to her relationship with me and got comments from her followers, people who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with her and enabling her stalking behavior. Lily had constructed this fake, intricate, fanfiction version of my life for anyone to share their opinion on, and she made herself out to be the hero. I went maybe a month back into this page's history. I did not look at everything that was there. Frankly, it made me sick. I'm not sure how long this had been going on for. I messaged Lily and confronted her about her fucked up little stalker shrine, and she said nothing. I cannot stress to you how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me, with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure that we ended up together, creating this messed up fantasy with two different versions of me in it. And when I confronted her, she acted like it never happened. She eventually deleted the page, or at least changed the name so that I couldn't find it. No way was I ever going to hang out with her again, but we still shared a class, and she was starting to scare me with what she might do next. 
I'm a paranoid person by nature, so knowing that someone was obsessively keeping track of me for who knows how long freaked me out. The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him feel awkward. He told me about it right away. What was her plan there? Did she hope that he would cheat on me with her and then wait for me to break up with him? When that dumpster fire of a plan failed, she tried hitting on three of my other friends. None of them took the bait. She ended up dating one of my former roommates for a while, but made sure to send me messages while they were together, letting me know that she would rather be with me. Bleh. No thanks. Lily made sure to stay in my life the entire time I was at that university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her, and that's when she started rumors about me, which damaged career opportunities that I had put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back, but it made me realize it was safer to let her think that she was part of my life rather than doing something that would cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily was still trying to claw her way back into my life. I almost stopped posting on social media entirely by this point. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations. I usually just ignored her. I didn't like to think how she was still tracking me online. The last time we had a real conversation was when she messaged me out of nowhere and thinking about what transpired makes my skin crawl. But I'll summarize what happened. She started asking me very personal questions about my sexuality. I really didn't want to talk about that with her, but I told her some basic stuff. Then she changed the subject and began talking about how would I feel if she was a boy. There was something seriously wrong with this girl. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, but she responded by sending photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one arrived, basically quoting back what I had told her about myself as if she was role-playing as me, trying to absorb my history like some kind of parasite. I cut off all communication with her after that. I eventually deleted her from all of my social media pages, which was the only real way she had of contacting me now. I really thought that she might have finally moved on, but only a few days ago, she sent me another friend request. It's sitting there unanswered, because I know that if I delete it, she'll only send another one. For some perspective, Lily and I first met nearly 12 years ago. This story here is just the highlights, and even then, it's only the stuff that I know about.